please open your copies of God's Word to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew, the seventh chapter. Our text is taken from two simple verses in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Hear the word of Christ. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. My message this morning is taken from two very simple headings. Heading number one, introductory considerations necessary to the understanding of our text. Introductory considerations. As you probably recognize, this text is taken from our Lord's first great discourse commonly referred to as the Sermon on the Mount, recorded in chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew's Gospel. This sermon, at least portions of this sermon, have come to be applauded even in the secular, non-religious world. There are statements in this sermon that you can hear even today in popular culture. The verse that precedes our text is one of the most familiar moral uh, axioms in the world. Uh, Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. And you hear people say that to each other and parents to their children, people who don't go to church, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. When I was growing up, I am quite sure that the most familiar text in the Bible was John 3.16. I wish that were still the case. Uh, I'm convinced that verse 1 of Matthew 7 is the only text that many people know from the Bible. Judge not, lest you be judged. And you hear that all the time. The fact that it's taken out of its context and misapplied is, uh, well, it's very sad. It's really a tragic thing that this sermon is known only in certain fragments, a piece here and a piece there, and, and that is often true even among God's people. In order to understand this sermon, it was our Lord's first, but it was never intended to stand alone. This sermon was designed by our Savior to be introductory, to his mission as the builder of God's kingdom among men. And in order to understand this sermon correctly, you need to take into consideration all the sermons that Christ preached. Trying to understand the Sermon on the Mount in isolation from all other sermons is a futile effort. You need also to bring to bear upon this sermon the works of Christ, all the works of Christ. They're necessary to help inform your mind of what he is saying and doing in this sermon, and particularly, particularly supremely, his cross work. You also need to bring alongside the Sermon on the Mount what his apostles wrote about him under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, thankfully, we have access to all that material. We have all the recorded sermons and the recorded works, and we have the commentary inspired by the Holy Spirit in the writing of the apostles. And we need all that 
to really understand what Christ is teaching us in his very first sermon. Again, it was introductory. There are three things in particular that you need to keep in mind regarding the Sermon on the Mount. You need to have it in mind now. Whenever you read the Sermon on the Mount, you need to have these three things before you. First, this sermon explains and expounds the righteous will of God for all human thought and action in this fallen world. Here, by his son, God is telling us how life in this fallen world ought to be lived, how people ought to think, how they ought to behave. And if any human thinks to make himself acceptable to God, he must live this kind of life. He must think and speak and do what this sermon tells him to think and speak and do. Which is another way of saying that this sermon has been given to acquaint us with how far removed we are from God. And how far removed we are from the life, the behavior, the conduct that is acceptable in God's sight. This sermon is very much like the law that helps us appreciate our lostness. Secondly, the Sermon on the Mount must not be divorced from the preacher who preached it. Christ is revealing himself. In the sermon, he is showing us. Now, this is very important. In this sermon, Christ is showing us the life that he came to produce in all who follow him. He's teaching us what he alone can produce in human beings. In this sermon... The Savior describes the thinking and the behavior into which he leads every person who follows him. We talk, I think, a lot appropriately about following Christ. We urge people to follow Christ. But the question might be asked of us, what does that look like? What does a life following Christ look like? It looks like this. It looks like the life described in the Sermon on the Mount. Thirdly, you must embrace the fact that this kind of holy kingdom living cannot happen apart from Not just the instruction of Christ, but an intimate heart connection to Christ. You can't follow Christ as he specifies in this sermon unless you are wedded to him in your heart. Unless you are spiritually joined to him. You see, this sermon forces us to confront Two very hard questions. The first question, the first question is this. How can we escape? How can we escape the condemnation that is brought to light by this sermon? Look back at chapter 5, verses 27 and 28. Christ says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In the sight of God, the act of adultery is condemned. But in the sight of God, the thought of adultery is condemned. Who is innocent? Even if by God's common grace, at least, we have not committed the act of adultery. Who can say he is free of the thought of it? 
So in God's sight, on some level, we are all adulterers. Now, think about yourself as an adulterer. Elsewhere in the New Testament, we are told that adulterers cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We are told that the sexually immoral have their place in the lake of fire which burns forever. And we all are adulterers, at least spiritually, and God condemns that. So how are we going to escape? Adulterers have their place in the lake of fire. We're adulterers. How are we going to qualify for heaven as adulterers? That's one hard question. The second hard question is this. Even if somehow we were forgiven for our sexual immorality, at least mentally, our sexual fantasies that so offend God who sees and hears everything. Even if we could be forgiven, how would we change so that we would stop sinning? If our sins were wiped out, we still have to live this life. How are we going to change? And let me warn you. Let me warn you against the thought that you don't have to live like this. That the only thing that counts is forgiveness. If you can just be forgiven, it really doesn't matter how you live. If you can just have the imputed righteousness of Christ, and if you can have the efficacy of his death applied to you, your sins are blotted out, it doesn't matter how you live. Wrong. Go to the end of chapter 7. We have to reckon with these words in chapter 7, verses 21 through 27. Frightening words. Christ says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And perhaps there will be many in that day who will say, Lord, Lord, we profess faith in you. We believed in your power to take away our sins. Maybe, maybe there will be people like that. But I will then declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. And the fact that I never knew you is demonstrated by your habitual practice of lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house. And it fell, and great was the fall of it. Two serious questions press upon us from this sermon. Number one, how do you escape the condemnation for not living this kind of life? And secondly, how do you change so that you can conform to this pattern? And the answer to both questions is the same. It's Jesus Christ himself. Not just Jesus Christ, the great teacher, but Jesus Christ, the substitute. Jesus Christ, the eternal God who became man without sin and lived before God that life that God requires of all men, 
But we can't live because we're fallen and ruined. He lived that life. He made a perfect satisfaction to that which God required. And then, having proven that he was not worthy of death and condemnation, he died. And he allowed himself to be condemned. And he allowed the, the sins of people like you and me to be imputed to him. And then God crushed him with the wrath that our sins deserve. You must have Christ as your Redeemer. But you must also have Christ as your transformer, as the Lord who comes in and drives out the strong man and makes all things new, who reshapes your mind and your heart and redirects your steps. You must have Christ. This is a great sermon. It gives us a lot of wonderful truth. But the sermon is worthless without Christ and without a personal union with Christ through faith. Well, there are some, I think, important introductory statements now. Let's come to the actual content of our text, verses 13 and 14 of chapter 7. This text is actually an invitation. It's a wonderful invitation accompanied with explanations and arguments. Enter by the narrow gate. That's a wonderful invitation to people who are perishing. Enter by the narrow gate. Now the first question that confronts us right off is, what's a gate? What is the gate? Imagine Saturday morning about 10 o'clock, a friend calls and says, look, I had a friend who was going with me to the big football game and he had to cancel out. I have an extra ticket. Can you get here? Do you want it? Well, kickoff's at 12 noon. You're going to have to hustle. I'll meet you at the gate. So you hustle around, you change clothes, jump in your car, you, you drive through the mass of people you get and to the car lot and pay your 25 bucks to park your car. And, and you make it to the stadium, and then it dawns on you. There's not one gate. There are eight. And they're all around the stadium. And there's 75,000 people. Which gate? Which gate? All kinds of religious leaders have identified numerous gates. Some say baptism is a gate. Some say the church is the gate. Become a member of the church you're in. Some say, no, it's all the sacraments and they have multiplied the list of sacraments, and you have to keep them all. That's the gate. And more and more, you're actually being told that you are the gate. You're the gate. Just do the best you can. You're in. Just be sincere. You're in. Doesn't matter which God you worship. You don't even have to worship God. Just be the best human that you can be. It's a very important question. It's really the most important question of all. What is the gate? Well, our Lord graciously answers that question for us in another text. In John chapter 10, these words are recorded from the mouth of Christ. Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and that they might have it. More abundantly, I am the door. I am the gate to eternal life. I am. And my dear ones, don't be deceived. There are not many gates. 
There are not multiple gates. There's only one gate. There's only one way to God to be right and acceptable before God. There's only one way to survive death without passing into a greater death. There is only one way to eternal life, and that is Christ. He said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Only one gate. Next, in the text, note, please, the place, and this is kind of an obscure thought. Preachers think obscure thoughts, but try to follow. Notice the place of this invitation with regard to the sermon as a whole. I'm sure you have observed your pastors. They have a certain order to the way they preach. They have an introduction, and then they have the main body of their sermon in which they tell you, teach you what they want you to learn. And then, at the end, they have conclusions and applications. You observe that. Well, Christ followed that model in the Sermon on the Mount. The body of the sermon is full of instruction and exhortation. But now he's coming to the end of the sermon. And most interpreters see verse 13 as the beginning of our Lord's conclusion. Here he is making application of the entire sermon to that congregation. What he is saying, in effect, is this. I have set before you life in the kingdom of God. Life that leads to eternal glory. Life that leads to immortality. Now, choose this life. Enter the gate. Come to me. Trust me. It's an invitation. At the end of the sermon, Christ I think was saying, I know this sermon has laid you low and stripped you of all hope of gaining favor with God by your own works. But now at the end, I invite you to come to me. I am the gate. I can lead you into life eternal. Third observation. I would have you notice the entirely gracious nature of this invitation. Christ was speaking to a congregation of Jews. They knew the true God. They knew the law of God. And they all knew in their heart of hearts that they had broken that law, that they should have lived better lives than they had lived. They all knew in their consciences that they had fallen short of the glory of God. Do you know that about yourself? Surely you must. Surely you must. Maybe, maybe you've tried very hard to convince yourself that you're a good person. And so you compare yourself with Hitler. So you'll feel good. But in your conscience, you know you've lied. And you've lusted. And you've hated. But most of all, you've broken the number one commandment. You haven't loved God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's that's the number one commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with the totality of your humanity. And you haven't. You loved all kinds of gifts from God much more than you've loved God. You don't deserve eternal life. Do you know that? You don't deserve heaven. But you have this invitation. Enter the gate. And if you're thinking rightly, you will think, I don't deserve to enter the gate. But the text says nothing about deserving It says nothing about passing a test in order to enter the gate. The text says, come, come, enter the gate. It's gracious. 
You don't have to pass the test. But you do have to enter the gate. You do have to come to Jesus. You do have to believe on him. And he will save you. He'll let you in. He'll take you from the realm of condemnation to the realm of life. But you have to come to him. It's gracious, this invitation. Observation number four. It's gracious, but it's gracious, but the invitation comes in the form of the imperative. It's a command. It's, it's an invitation given in the form of a command. It's like Jesus says, enter by the gate. It's akin to someone shouting, leave here to a room full of people, a room that is being covered in suffocating smoke, and the people are disoriented and they're panicking and they can't see their way out. And someone shouts, here's the door, enter here. Christ is speaking in the imperative because of the urgency of the invitation. You don't have time to wait. And there is no other gate and there is no other escape. You must enter here, now, now. You must enter. Christ used similar language In a situation described in Luke 13, someone said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? We often speculate those kind of things. Christ didn't entertain the speculation. He said to them, strive to enter through the narrow gate. It's not time to ask questions about whether many or few are to be saved. You strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able when once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door. Let me tell you, beloved, as far removed as this may seem from your conscious reality, there will come a day when you will want to enter. There will come a day when every man, woman, and child that comprises the human race will want to enter, but it'll be too late. The end will have come, and Christ will come, and he will come, but he won't come as a Savior. He will come as a reigning Lord and a triumphant judge, and it'll be too late. So Christ says, it is urgent that you enter now. Choose the narrow gate and the difficult way while you may. You can't get to heaven any other way. And you could die at any moment. It could be over in a millisecond. But now you have breath and you have life. And now in the providence of God, you're here and the invitation is being extended. Enter now. It's really important that you hear what I just tried to say. You cannot arrive in heaven apart from Christ. Now listen. And you cannot have Christ apart from following him down this narrow, difficult path. He is the gate. But on the other side of the gate, there's a path. You don't come to Christ and immediately go to heaven. Most of us don't. We come to Christ and then we continue to live. But how do we live after we come to Christ? Well, on the other side of Christ, there's a narrow path. And at the end of the narrow path, there is the celestial city. So you have to come and enter the gate. Believe on Christ. Follow him. But you have to follow him where he leads you.
There is no salvation apart from Christ. I hope you've heard that a lot. I know you have if you regularly attend this church. In this day of confusion and pluralism, you can't hear it too often. There is only one way to be saved. There is only one redemption. There was no redemption till Jesus came. He had to live. He had to die. He had to rise triumphant over death. There was no redemption in the world till Jesus came. We so what about those Old Testament saints? They believed in the coming Christ. There was no redeemer till Christ came. And there will be no other redeemer. Redemption is now accomplished. Think of the salvation that Christ established as a treasure chest. We, we too often try to make salvation just one thing. Salvation is a treasure chest that Christ created by his work. And in that treasure chest, there are jewels of infinite value. There's justification. The full and free forgiveness of your sins and imputed righteousness that answers all God's demands. You come to Christ, you get it. It's free. Reconciliation with God. God's anger is turned from you. And you have peace with God. And there will be no more condemnation, no more anger toward you. You're reconciled to God. There's adoption. In Adam, you became part of a defiled, ruined, and condemned family, a terrible family. But when you come to Christ, you are adopted into God's family, and you become a brother to Christ, an heir of glory. But also in this treasure chest, there's a new heart, a better heart. And there's a gift to the Holy Spirit, so you're never on your own again. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you. And there is, there is a place reserved in heaven with your name on it. <clears throat> and there is, in this treasure chest, a GPS with a destination set heaven. I don't know how people lived before GPS. It was a long drive from North Carolina. And once we got here, um, it was confusing <laughs> getting where we needed to be. And I remember the old days when you had to have an atlas in your hand and you're trying to read those signs, they're always too small and obscure. And you're trying to drive and dodge all these people and read the... It's a wonder we all didn't die. <laughs> I have a GPS in my car and navigation system. A sweet lady tells me where to go. <laughs> Normally, I don't take directions from women, but I'm thankful for her. And she tells me, turn here, and in a half mile, you'll turn to the right. And I say, thank you. In this salvation treasure chest, there is a GPS. And it directs your daily travels from the moment you enter the gate until you arrive safe in heaven. The GPS will lead you down a very narrow and difficult way. But it is the only way that leads to life. It's a revolutionary way. It's a new way. You never walked that way before. You would never walk that way without Christ. It's revolutionary. It changes your thinking. And it brings you into conflict with the thinking of all the people around you. 
You don't walk this narrow path in order to earn heaven. It's simply an exercise of faith. It's part of believing in Jesus. You come to Jesus to save you from your sins. You want to be delivered from the practice and habit of sin. And part of that deliverance is to walk down the path that he prescribes to you, believing that he will direct you and strengthen you. And by following this path, you will have deliverance. My beloved, if you would be saved, you have to have the whole treasure chest. You can't just reach in and say, I like justification. I like that. I'll take that. I, I like reconciliation with God. I, I like the throne of grace. I can go and have my prayer. I like, I'll take that. This GPS business, you can keep that. It doesn't work like that. You see, you are justified so you can be qualified to have the GPS. You're not qualified to walk this path unless your sins are forgiven. Justification qualifies you to walk the narrow path. What God the Father sent Jesus Christ to do, to gain, is not simply a justified and forgiven people. What God wants is a new humanity, a new race of people that are different, changed, that are being conformed to the image of his Son. And that's what Christ gives you when you come to him. Observation number five, why is the way called narrow? Why is the gate and the way called narrow? Why is it narrow? The word means tight, restrictive. Well, two simple answers. It's called narrow because only one person can enter at a time. It's like a turnstile at a coliseum. You can't enter as a family. Every member of your family may be a Christian. You think that gets you in. It doesn't. You can't enter as a group, you can't enter as a family, you can't enter as a group of people, your friends. You have to enter one at a time. You must come to Christ yourself. You must call upon Christ yourself. It's also called narrow because you can't take anything with you through the gate. You have to leave your sins at the gate. The habits of sin, but also the guilt and stench and the corruption, and you leave it with Christ. Isn't that good news? You bring your filth and your dirt and your bad habits, and you give them to Christ. You also have to leave your good works, because your good works really aren't good in God's sight. You can't take them through the gate. You leave your good works at the gate. You can't take your treasures. You have to take everything that's valuable to you and you have to give it to Christ and he'll give it back to you in the way, shape that is best for you. The gate is called narrow because it, com it compels us to a complete self-abandonment. We must give ourselves in totality to Christ. Well, why is the path on the other side of the gate say, said to be difficult? Look at verse 14. Because narrow is the gate and difficult. Difficult is the way that leads to life. I thought it was all grace. It says it's a difficult path. It's all grace. It's grace to be on that path. It's difficult not because it's unreasonable, but because it is so counterintuitive and it's so countercultural, it's contrary to the way we have been taught to think. We have been taught to be proud and self confident and self reliant and self assertive, and we come to Christ and He teaches us poverty of spirit, to mourn over sin. 
He teaches us to be meek and to be humble. That's counterintuitive. We have to reshape our idea about why we live. You see, most of us as Americans, we have taken our vision of life from carnal happiness and gaining as many toys as we could gain. Christ redefines our lives. Our mission now is to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Our mission on the other side of the gate is to show the world as much of Jesus as we possibly can. It's a revolutionary life. It's a new life. It's a life that has meaning. It's a life that matters. But it's out of step with all the people around you. So I have to be honest. You must enter the gate. You cannot be spared the wrath of God without entering the gate. But when you enter the gate, you enter a different world. And you will be thought strange. But Christ is on that path. And God's smile is on that path. And God's blessing is on that path. And at the end of the path is heaven. And so that brings me to the question. Will you choose? If you have never chosen before, will you choose the narrow gate and the difficult path today. At birth, all of us enter the wide gate. By nature, we all walk the broad path. It's a way of nature. It's very accommodating. The masses walk the broad path. Liberals and conservatives walk the same broad path. They want you to think that they're on the same broad path. All races and all nationalities, irrespective of cultural differences, all the masses of the nations are on the broad path. Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, they all walk that path, as do many Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists, and almost all Catholics, they're all on the same path. The rich, the poor, the mighty, the weak, the avant-garde, the traditionalist, they're all walking together on the same broad path. There's no creed on the path. There's no moral law unless you want one. Everyone believes what they want, and they do what they want on the broad path. It's easy to walk the broad path. But there's no peace with God there. There's no smile of God there. There's no answered prayer there. There's no forgiveness there. There's no safety there. It leads to destruction. It leads to the unending experience of God's anger. That's where it leads. My dear friend, God may allow you to live pretty much as you want in this world. He may allow you to disregard his law and to stick up your thumb at his son. He may do that. I hope he won't, but he may. But I'll tell you something. When you get to the end, and it's closer than any of us think, when you get to the end, at death, everyone abides by his laws in the world to come. There's no broad path. There's hell. This is urgent. I set before you today the way of life. In the name of the Son of God, I invite you to come to him. He will have you. 
He, he sent me here and he sent you here so you could hear this message. He invites you to come. Why will you perish? Life is set before you. It's Christ. Call on him. Seek him. Believe on him. And be saved. Let's pray. Father, who are we that we should hear the message of life when so many never hear? They have the light of nature, they have the witness of conscience, but they never hear about Jesus. They never hear about the gate and the path that leads to life eternal. Who are we that we should hear? And hear so often. And hear so much. Oh, Father, don't let it be that any of us with this enormous privilege would perish in our sins. And if there are those, and no doubt there are, who came to this meeting walking the broad path, Oh, dear Father, by the strength of your power working through the gospel, take them off that path. Bring them to Jesus. Give them grace to see him as altogether lovely and valuable. Give them grace to call upon him, to entrust their souls, their lives, their eternities to him, to give him their sins, to give him everything and to receive him as he offers himself. And for those of us who have believed on him for a long time, may our faith be renewed. May the joy of our salvation be fresh and new. We pray rejoicing in Christ. Amen.